Hello everybody, welcome back to Read and Reread. I am Angelia and today, this is the first of several videos I'm going to make as I proceed along in my 30 stories in 30 days Shorty September project. It's just a little check-in to talk about the first six stories because if I waited and talked about them all at once, it would be hours and hours long because there's gonna be 30 stories. Also, last year I tried just sort of sliding them in during Friday reads and it just made this big clunky extra part at the end every week of that. I don't like to make super long videos. I'm afraid people just kind of space out or lose interest if they get past a certain length. I, I fear that the material doesn't hold up for that long a time. So instead I'm going to make several shorter videos and so I'm going to talk about these six stories I'm going to attempt to be as spoiler free as possible, but, but they are short. So to talk about them at all, you do have to talk about a few details from the story, but I won't give away any big, uh, the ending or any big reveals in my discussion. It's going to be kind of not a, not a deep, just not a deep dive. Okay. Let's stop talking about what I'm going to talk about. And I should just talk about what I'm going to talk about. All right, so the first story from September 1st was Good Country People by Flannery O'Connor. As I mentioned before, the story I selected, even though I did it last year, because I will do it every year and until the end of time because it is my favorite short story. And this uh, particular short story is in the collection A Good Man is Hard to Find. I was uh, realizing that Flattery O'Connor's two short novels would also be choices that would fit in perfectly for Shorty September, Wise Blood and The Violent Bear Away. They're both very short. They're very weird, memorable. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. We're here to talk about good country people. We have uh, basically four characters in this story. There's a young woman whose given name was Joy, but she has legally changed it to Holga who is, uh, I think she's 32. She lives at home with her mother. She is angry, she's frustrated. She has a PhD in philosophy and she has a prosthetic leg from a hunting accident from when she was a child. She lives in perpetual exasperation with her mother, Mrs. Uh, Hopewell. So. Her original name was Joy Hopewell, and she, she wasn't having any part of that. Now she's Holga Hopewell. But um, Mrs. Hopewell, if she, if she lived today, her kitchen would be full of the live, love, laugh type signs um, because she exists in a mental space of platitudes, uh, homilies, uh, meaningless little positive thinking phrases. She's got a passive aggressive style to her conversation. We also have Mrs. Freeman who is uh, the wife of the hired man who's supposed to help around the farm. Mrs. Hopewell is a widow and needs some help and I think Mrs. Freeman is also supposed to be a housekeeper but mainly she just stands around and gossips and tells stories about her two daughters. Uh, what are their real names? I only can think of the name that uh, Holga assigns them. Their real names are Glenys and Carame, but Holga calls them Glycerin and Caramel, and she's just disdainful of everything. She thinks she's reached some sort of higher plane of uh, thought and insight due to her education, but we find out that that's not really the case either. And the fourth person to round out this merry little bunch is a 19-year-old traveling Bible salesman going by the name of Manly Pointer. Manly Pointer, yes. Absolutely nothing phallic about that name suggestion. It's just a nice southern name. Okay, so let me just read to you the opening part of the opening paragraph of this book because it is one of the great openers in short fiction besides the neutral expression that she wore when she was alone mrs freeman had two others forward and reverse that she used for all her human dealings her forward expression was steady and driving like the advance of a heavy truck her eyes never swerved to left or right, but turned as the story turned 
as if they followed a yellow line down the center of it. She seldom used the other expression because it was not often necessary for her to retract a statement, but when she did, her face came to a complete stop. There was an almost imperceptible movement of her black eyes during which they seemed to be receding. And then the observer would see that Mrs. Freeman, though she might stand there as real as several grain sacks thrown on top of each other, was no longer there in spirit. So the conversations between Mrs. Hopewell and Mrs. Freeman are just um, priceless. And so anyway, the Bible salesman comes along, uh, spends hours uh, inanely chit-chatting with Mrs. Hopewell and tries to sell some Bibles and makes a little plan to meet up later with Holga. Holga has some <clears throat> misguided fantasies about what's going to happen at this meeting. And what she's thinking reveals part of her self-delusions, and then what happens reveals even more of it. But this, there's this one little passage where she's looking forward to this, to this meeting, and she, she thinks, she's thinking this. During the night, she had imagined that she seduced him. She imagined that the two of them walked on the place until they came to the storage barn beyond the two back fields, and there she imagined that things came to such a pass that she very easily seduced him and that then, of course, she had to reckon with his remorse. True genius can get an idea across even to an inferior mind. She imagined that she took his remorse in hand and changed it into a deeper understanding of life. She took all his shame away and turned it into something useful. <sighs> now, the distance between that and what actually occurs is what makes this story so good. And I cannot talk too much about the eventualities of this plot because it is so perfect. And I don't, it's, it's so darkly funny. And the paragraph, I won't tell you what is happening, but towards the end of this story, there is a paragraph that I think is my favorite paragraph in all of literature. Although there are, a, that would be a great top 10. 10 favorite paragraphs out of my favorite novels. But the paragraph where he actually opens his Bible case, that entire paragraph, I laugh out loud every time, and it is just my all-time favorite. But uh, good country people, it's, it's Southern, it's weird, it's funny, it's dark, and I love it so much. And... Um, I don't know. It, it reveals a lot about my taste and my frame of mind and what I think is funny. Um, this is getting a little backwards in the discussion, but I first discovered Flannery O'Connor during a class I took. I was an English major and I took a class in short fiction. This is one of the authors that the professor had selected that I had never read before. And I just fell in love with this and, and then went on to read more of her works. And Flannery O'Connor brought my husband and I together as well because we over I can't even remember which of us was I think it was I think I busted into his conversation that he was having with someone about Flannery O'Connor I heard someone at a party talking about Flannery O'Connor and I just barged in and I grabbed that man and I I held on to him forever so anyway that was story one and that's why it is story one good country people by Flannery O'Connor the next story is Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville. Now, I am not a giant Melville fan. I have read, um, I have never read Moby Dick. I have read several of his other short stories and short novels that I just did not get into. They thought they were sort of dry or boring or just too morose. But I love the story Bartleby the Scrivener. And I read the copy in this big old. Harper American Literature, Volume 1. And so, first of all, um, the story starts out very funny. We have a narrator who is an older man who is a lawyer, and he tells us right at the start that he deliberately pursued not the exciting courtroom drama kind of law, but a more sedate, um, less less fireworks, better schedule kind of um, 
legal documents like property deeds and things like that. And so he draws up these kind of documents. And since this is the mid 1800s, he has to write everything out by hand and write all the copies out by hand. So that that's where the scriveners come in, a profession that no longer exists. They make the copies. They need to be people with a careful eye for detail and good handwriting, basically. And the two scriveners that he has, one of them is really no good in the morning and the other one's no good in the afternoon. So he needs another one. He hires Bartleby. There's also uh, a young kid who runs out and does their errands and delivers things. And so the early part of the story is describing the setup of this office and the pre-existing employees. And then Bartleby comes into this picture. And at first he seems industrious. He has a nice hand. His documents look good. But a problem arises when it comes time to do a necessary but tedious task, which is when everybody stands around with copies, the copies that they've made, and they read them together line by line with a fine tooth comb to find any errors because that could make it legally, you know, null and void. And when it, the time comes around to do one of these proof readings, Bartleby utters his famous line, I prefer not to. So we have Bartleby. He is the original quiet quitter. He has set some boundaries in his workplace and our narrator does not know how to respond. And it, it starts there, but it progresses. And his efforts to figure out Bartleby or get him to do things, and it just kind of goes on from there. Uh, first of all, this is the most boring job. This workplace, it is like a prototype of every story or show about an incredibly boring office and people trying to um, trying to just survive one another and all of their idiosyncrasies. There's a line in here that I love <clears throat> that is nothing so aggravates an earnest person as a passive resistance. And just that whole idea of somebody being calm, unflappable and unbudgeable and the other person just getting more and more frenzied about the situation. So, it, it does begin, it's a lot of fun at the beginning. It's funny, the descriptions of the people in the office and just this kind of record screech moment when Bartleby first just says, I prefer not to. But then it takes a dark turn and it goes really interior on this narrator and trying to understand Bartleby and understand himself and what he should be doing. And so... I don't, it's just a really, it's a story like no other. It reminds you of things in the current day. It has a timeless quality, but as a piece of fiction from the 19th century, it's it's pretty weird. And I, re I really enjoyed reading it again. So Bartleby the Scrivener. All right. And then, oh, and, and by the way, I got to bring Tom Lake up again. There is a Bartleby moment in Tom Lake that's that's kind of funny because something happens in the story and someone recognizes it as a Bartleby moment and then some other people in the scene are like, the what? And they, they have no idea. So they need to go and read Bartleby, the Scrivener too. All right, for September 3rd, the story was Eula from The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. I just chose the first story in the collection because I hadn't read anything in the collection. But if you check out my bookmark, I am now in the middle of the book. So I'm already off track. Last year, it was Night of the Living Res that threw me off track and I kept sneaking back and reading that book. And this year, it's The Secret Lies of Church Ladies. So even though I'm reading a bunch of other stuff, I keep um, I keep picking this back up and I, I'm... I'm going ahead so because it's really really good so the story eula is fairly short these stories vary in length but the first one is pretty short and we have two women who are about 40 and they have a tradition that they've been doing for about 10 years of getting together and booking a hotel room and celebrating new year's eve together they bring food they bring champagne they watch the ball drop on tv and talk about maybe going to New York someday, and they have sex all night. 
this is a great example of a story that's pretty short with just this crystallized moment. And then they've been doing this without discussing really what's happening for years and years. And they say something in the story about, you know, this is, these are the things we don't talk about. And they, they kind of get into an argument when Caroletta said, Eula starts talking about her New Year's resolutions, how she's going to become more active at church. And she's going to join the softball team and she's going to do this and that. And come to realize that Eula is perceiving herself as a virgin. And Caroletta's kind of like, what? <laughs> and and it's so funny because, you know, the one woman is compartmentalizing the this passionate night that they have with each other on on the repeat and as not being sex and Caroletta is a little further along in her thought process about what she's doing all year long versus how she feels when she's with Eula and so I don't want to give any more of it away because it's just not a very long story but it is a great story and it is a great opener to this collection and I and I will be talking about this on Friday Reads when I get through with the whole book. Everybody who has recommended this book and given high praises to it, and especially Greg at Supposedly Fun, nobody was lying. This is really good. So I'll be talking about it more. All right, so the next day was September 4th, and two of the stories from this week came from this book. Uh, this was the story, The Team by Tommy Orange. And when I saw that there was a story by Tommy Orange, I thought that was interesting because I've only ever read his his novel There There. And I did find out that he does have a new novel coming out, I think, in uh, 2024. So we can look forward to that. But this particular... Okay, first of all, let me back up for a minute. This book is a collection of the stories that were um, gathered during 2020 in a project called the Decameron Project that the New York Times Magazine put together. There's a website as well, I believe. And um, anyway, at, at, during 2020, the editors sent out kind of a call for writers to submit stories that kind of, it, it didn't have to be specifically about the lockdown and the pandemic, but something inspired by the current situation um, at that time. And they they pitched stories, a bunch of them were selected, some pretty big names are in the collection. And so, and of course the name of the project comes from the, the 14th century book, The Decameron, which is a group of people gathered together, quarantining from the Black Plague and telling stories. So Tommy Orange's story is specifically about being in the lockdown and in his story there's a narrator it's a second person approach like you did this and now you're doing that and it's the it maybe it's him I'm not really sure it could it kind of matches but the person um that had previously been training for a half marathon and had started by joining a group fitness training group but found them highly annoying so left them and started referring to their own personal project of getting ready ready for the run as the team that his his own um running uh calendar and his you know eating calendar all that that was the team so now the stories about how the team has shifted the running has fallen by the wayside and the team is about uh groceries and food prep and online school supervising and um, but then it also it, it kind of um, highlights how that time had aspects that were anxiety provoking or not fun at all but also kind of undiscovered pleasures sometimes uh, where this narrator has gotten more in touch with relatives that he had fallen out with and he's learning the Cheyenne language from his father uh, over Zoom. So it's just a, one of those little slices of life. I think it's interesting and how to, to consider how, um, if, if these kind of narratives will become 
part of the overall fabric of literature or will they be little dated episodes or some of both or how, how is that going to pan out in the long run? The next story was one that I've been anticipating for a long time and has been rec recommended to me more than once, uh, which was the Simplica Girl Diaries from the 10th of, from not the 10th, just 10th of December by George Saunders. And in general, people have suggested that I try stories from this book because I have a checkered history of trying and failing to enjoy George Saunders. And so I embarked on this story. First of all, it was longer than I expected. When I opened it up and it was 50-ish pages, I was like, oh no, the story of the day is almost a novella. And so it kind of threw me off. And, but I, but I plowed on and something kind of, the magic happened about halfway through. So the story begins, there is a father who is starting a journal. And let me read just the very beginning of his journal and you'll kind of get the sense of what the format of this story is. And so this, and the format is diary entries. So he does write in this slightly shorthandish style and at first it um, it reads just like uh, a man trying to capture everyday thoughts and we get um, an unfolding picture this is a, a man who's happily married has two daughters and they are kind of struggling middle class maxed out on the credit cards maxed out on debt and prone to comparing themselves with others who are financially better off so there's a scene, a very satirical scene, where they go to a birthday party of one of his older daughter's school friends, and these people are wealthy, and they have a rather obscene display of wealth and privilege and spoiled kids, and instead of just thinking, well, that's a load of crap, he, he internalizes and starts to feel bad that he cannot keep up with that. He his any efforts he has are going to fall short um, his daughter is fretting over her upcoming birthday which isn't possibly going to compete and that's kind of when the trouble starts so it seems very um quotidian at first and sort of uh you start to think well what is the point going to be something about comparing yourself to others or what's the real purpose of happiness or you know what what are we going for here and then you start to find out what a Simplica girl is. And it the, the reveal is gradual. It starts at the party and you don't quite understand what they are. But as you eventually find out, it takes a chilling turn. And then we get, uh, it gets strange. It gets a little... Uh, it, it's one of those stories where everything seems normal except this one really dystopic element and um, then his his family different families responses to this with the way he sees it his daughters his wife his father-in-law um, it's really it, it just got it got really good all of a sudden I was reading along going okay George Saunders and all of a sudden I was like whoa wait a minute and I don't want to tell you anything else about it. So now I am thinking, at first I was like, okay, I'm going to read this story whoop, back to the library. And now I'm like, wait a minute, I might need to look around in this book a little bit more. So that was a happy surprise because I was a little skeptical. And now I am hopeful, cautiously optimistic. I think that the last one uh, was again from the Decameron Project. And it is a story by Colin Toybean. And if you have been hanging around on my channel, you know that I am currently a little bit obsessed because I finally read a book by him, Brooklyn, and I am on the hunt for some nice secondhand copies of some of his other novels. And so I was very excited that he contributed a story to this collection, and it's called Tales from the L.A. River. And this is another one that is pretty much this is autobiographical little story about he and his boyfriend uh, sequestered in Los Angeles during the lockdown and um, 
he they get kind of caught up in a case of comparatitis with some of the things that you see on social media so he he describes the differences between them because his his boyfriend is I think somewhat younger than him and is French and they like different music they like different movies they like different books and they're coexisting in this small space around the clock he says um, a couple of things Mankind is divided into those who started to listen to Bach and Beethoven in their late teens and those who did not. H did not. Instead, he had a huge collection of vinyl, hardly any of which was classical and not much of which I liked. And H and I had not read any of the same books. His first language was French and his mind was speculative. Thus, in one room, he was busy with Jacques and Gilles, while in another, I was reading Jane and Emily. He read Harry Dodge, I read David Lodge. So they get a little bit obsessed with uh, someone that they say was a, a Midwestern writer who has uh, social media of all the happy things he does with his boyfriend. And I'm wondering, is this actually, who was that? Is this based on somebody real? And so they, they made cookies and they read to each other and they watched the movies that they both loved every night. And he just gets a little bit hung up and jealous about this compatibility and wonders why he and his true love are so different. Um, but anyway, it's just a little kind of little slice of life story. But I liked it. It made me do all this looking up. I had to look up stuff about his actual real life boyfriend who matches up to the guy in the story. I had to play a bunch of craft work songs because there's a scene where he tries to get with it and dance to his boyfriend's craft work album. I have craft work albums. I and I found some videos online of people dancing to craft work. So he could have taken a tutorial. I will put one of those in here just for fun. And um also, I'm still trying to figure out who the gay Midwestern writer with all of the happy posts could be. So if you have any clues, let me know down below. So that, that was just kind of a fun one. So that's the last one in the first batch. I will be back after the next six stories, but please let me know if you have read any of these stories, what do you think? Which ones do you love or not? Or if you have other uh, favorites by these authors or anything else, that you want to uh, tell me about, shoot me a comment down below. I appreciate you watching this video. Have a great day, and I will be back soon. I think the next video is probably a Friday read, so see you then. Bye-bye.